Todd <laughs> just got reading his web in, in his Facebook page. I've met Molly, Molly and Mark, listen to that, Holly and Mark <laughs> several years ago. We're both fans of Dog Rescue. So they sort of rescued me tonight, and I want to introduce Mark we, Smith. We rescued you. Yes, you did. I'm sorry, honey. No, no, no. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Mark. Thank you for having me. Mark is the Thank you for having me. Um, again, my name is Mark Smith, <coughs> Flatwoods Bee Farm. I'm, I'm a local. I was born and raised in Locust, so I don't live far from there. Still live there. And thank you, Pat, for inviting me to uh, to come talk tonight about the way I keep bees. Um, I'm a chemical-free beekeeper. I uh, in 2010, um, my girlfriend Holly, her and her precious mother which you can almost see in the background right there, planted the beekeeping seed in my head. Um, her, she grew up around bees. Her mom and dad, uh, back in the 80s and 90s, had, they kept in 30 to 40 colonies, basically for honey production. So they, uh, they planted the seed, and of course, you know, like things go, sometimes you take something and you just run with it. Well, that's what I did. I ran with it. So we got our first two packages of bees in uh, 2010, and I successfully killed every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I even took Bob Blackwater's B school oh, at Stanford no. Community College. Oh, no. So, <laughs> so in 2011, we went and took school again, and uh, got two more packages, and overwintered them. They lived, and. Uh, I guess it was uh, the spring of 2014, and I have no clue which order these slides are in, but that's okay. Here's my little, since we don't have a clicker, I'll, I'll do that. What's next? Okay. So in uh, 2014, I decided to, uh, and I'll tell you the story of why in just a second. I decided to go chemical free. And a lot of people might, might say, well, you know, chemical free, uh, people who use treat or treat their bees and stuff, you know, we all do things differently. That's one great thing about beekeeping is we have our own ways of mastering our craft. And I always like to refer to it as a craft because everybody does it differently. Even though we have a common objective, right? There's four, three of the most common objectives. We want, you know, good queens, we want good genetics so that the colonies survive. Obviously, we want healthy bees. You know, that's that's a frame of, a terror, of great looking bees. And of course, we want honey. We all want the same thing, but we all do it just a little bit differently. And hopefully tonight, I can I can share with you how I do it and, and how I've come up with my little program. Okay, anybody recognize those legs? <laughs> <laughs> Best looking legs I've ever seen in a bee yard. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I bust her chops about that every time she comes and inspects my bees. But uh, quick story. In uh, 2014, in the spring, um, you know, I think it was the second time Nancy had inspected my bees. Um, she came, did the inspection. And one particular colony, huge, very healthy. I mean, at the time I run double deeps, and I had, at the time I had, I had like four medium supers on this thing. It was a monster, okay? It was a beautiful colony of bees. Well, we got to that colony, 
and she said to, to do the inspection. And of course, you know, really the only thing Nancy's looking for is disease. And you know, so we opened it up and she went through all the frames <coughs> and she looked at me and she said, you wanna do a mic check? I said, sure. So we did a mic check on this colony. And she does a sugar roll check. Well, we quit counting at between 15 and 20 mics. Okay. According to the way we're taught, that should be a death sentence for that colony, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that colony, I'm not saying it's the same queen, but that colony had lived in that hive for three consecutive years. And they may have requeened, because at the time I didn't mark my queens. But that colony had been continuously occupied for at least three years. Well, I went home that night, and I thought about that. Golly, that thing should have died a long time ago. And I thought, maybe I'm on to something. So that day, I decided to venture into the chemical-free uh, realm and never look back. All right, let's see what's next. So let's get a definition straight. Um, in the treatment-free world, to me, treatment the term treatment-free is like an umbrella. For, for a couple of different things. Um, natural beekeeping is what some people call themselves. To me, the term natural beekeeping is when somebody takes a colony, puts them in a hive, burns incense around them, and chants and shakes <laughs> funny stuff over them. Okay? <laughs> that, to me, is not good beekeeping. To me, it's not, okay? If I had to choose a term or a title, you know, I guess I'm a chemical-free beekeeper because I haven't treated my bees since that day that Nancy and I found out with mice. I haven't treated any of my colonies since then. Never been without bees since then and haven't bought bees, so not so much as a queen, since 2011. Um, so... That's kind of the distinction between what some people call natural beekeeping. And I ain't got a problem with that. That's what, what you want to do, that's fine. But that's the distinction between that kind of beekeeping and chemical-free beekeeping. Uh, I, I don't want somebody to think that I just put bees in a box and say, kumbaya, it's not like that. <laughs> you do feed them, in other words. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know, some of the misnomers on chemical-free beekeeping um, that people have is like, oh my God, what do you do for mite control? <sighs> to be honest with you, I don't even think about mites anymore. It's amazing how much more I enjoy beekeeping when I take that out of the equation. I told a guy the other day that uh, we were talking about mites. And I looked at him and I said, I, said, I don't mind mites. And this guy treated me. He, he treats his bees. I said, shoot, I use mites as a treatment. And he looked at me, and we've known each other for a while. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, look, look at it like this. The way I keep bees, mites take care of my bad genetics. The genetics that I can't, that won't survive and won't live with mites. I'm not trying to do away with mites. I won't colonies that can live with the mite. The mite's not going to go anywhere. I mean, you, uh, you can treat colonies and, and get your, and, and have real good mite counts, but you didn't kill all the mites. There's still mites in there. So that's, I, I, I really don't even think about mites anymore. Disease control, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with, uh, Home and nutrition, we'll talk about that too. So here's my management program. Um, and this is the way I've been able to go chemical free. You, I couldn't, you can't just do it and, 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 and think that, that the bees will survive. You have to have a method to your madness. And you know, the world of beekeeping is just full of YouTube, Facebook, books, all this kind of stuff, all these people who travel all over the world doing seminars, and that's fine and that's great. 
And some beekeepers uh, attach themselves to a certain, um, I guess, beekeeper, the way they do things. The best thing I have found to do is take a little bit from a whole bunch of different people. And I've even got some some things that I do, especially with, with doing queens, that come from people who treat. So I take a little bit from a whole bunch of people and put it in my program. If it, if it works, great. If it don't work, uh, we won't do that no more. So, uh, so this is my program. And, and the best way that I... Now, of course, let me be honest with you, this is the first program I've ever done in front of people. I talk in front of Cabarrus County all the time, but about little five-minute intervals. So we're going to go month by month, and let me get my, my cheat sheet here. Let's start with January. Um, of course, in January, there's really not that much we can do, except look at it, just like that, like that. Sometimes, sometimes in, you know, in this area, We'll have a, a few days where they can fly and have cleansing flights, but there's not that much I do in January. But in February, usually right around the third or fourth week of February, you can start doing life checks. And this is this is important for me because I need to see what, what's alive, what, what has made it. Because at that point, <clears throat> what didn't make it, I do an autopsy. I try to figure out why. Plus two, I want to do something with that comb um, before wax moths uh, start messing around. So, first see if, it, if they're alive, okay? Some colony, and, and usually by the end of February, you can, you can get into a colony for just a little bit to check to see if they have stores left. Are they queen right? Do you see eggs? Do you see any brood? Um, is the queen laid? And the, the last one, Remove dry sugar, that goes back to what, what you said, and I'll, this ties in with the end of the presentation. I do what's called mountain camp feeding um, over the winter. It's my insurance policy. So, so at this time, I remove that. What, what is dry sugar? Dry sugar. I don't know what that is. Granulated sugar. sugar. Put sugar, sugar. sugar. Yeah, I'll get, yeah. I, that'll, that'll come at the end. Never heard of that. Yep, so it works great. So, so at that time, you know, usually the third or fourth week in February, we've got red maple blooming, and, and the way I look at it, uh, anything I've got alive when red maple blooms, I can I can keep it alive. Okay, um, so I'll take my I'll take my dry sugar off. Now, this this pollen substitute um, question. Starts a lot of conversations with me. I do not stimulate growth in my colonies in the spring with pollen substitutes, pollen patties, and stuff like that. Here's why. You know, a lot of beekeepers this time of year in February, and March, they'll and sometimes January, they'll start putting poll pollen patties on their hives to stimulate brood growth. Okay. Well, the way I look at it, the more I stimulate brood growth unnaturally at that time of year. Well, guess what else I'm producing? I'm producing mites, okay? So I had much rather the colony build up naturally with first is red maple. Once the red maple starts blooming, they'll, they'll start building up with that. Well, you've got hembit and uh, dead nettle also. Once, those, once they can start foraging on stuff like that, they will naturally start brooding up. So I don't use pollen substitute, um, and that's why, because I don't want to stimulate premature colony growth, thus stimulating mite growth, okay? Let's see what's next. Okay, and by this time, I'm down to, you know, that's kind of what I do in February, and then we get to March. March, we can start working in the colonies. And there's two really key things in my program that I do that is a little different than, uh, in regular beekeeping schedules is I'll rate my colonies. And the reason I want to rate the colonies that have survived is I want to give them a, a, a numeric value, okay, just so I can see how strong they are. The first thing I do without smoking them at all, whoop, 
Go back. No, nope. I didn't point. <laughs> it it <laughs> <a new> hey. <laughs> so the first thing I do is I'll, I'll lean the colonies up like this. No smoke, okay? I don't want to smoke the bees. Now, what's the first thing that bees do when you smoke them? They move, okay? I don't want them to move, all right? Because what I want to do is I want to tilt that colony up and I'm going to look underneath it with no smoke right where the bees are laying and most of or where they're at on the comb. And I'm going to count how many seams of bees I see, okay? Now, what I call a seam, a seam of bees is I look in there and between two frames, I see bees, okay? And <clears throat> usually it's right toward the center of the, of the column, okay? I'll count that, write it down. And then I'll, then I'll set it back down, give it a little smoke, calm them down. And then I start counting frames of brood, okay? I don't care if it's capped, uncapped brood, I count all of it, and I write that down. And then I look at the stores that are left over from the wintertime, and I'll count that. But the honey stores, I give that each frame a value of two, okay? Because, did I cut this off? Okay. Um, because to me, the frames of honey is very important to what I'm trying to figure out here. Because one, the colony's alive, they, they didn't eat themselves to death, and they also are frugal, okay? That col if a colony has more frames of, of, of capped honey or honey than others, they're more frugal. That means something to me, okay? But I know that colony is not going to eat itself out of house and home. So I'll write all that down, add it up, um, and come up with a numeric value. I'll write it on the side of the hive, okay? So frames of, <coughs> seams of bees, count them, they get a value of one. Write that down. Frames of brood, each, each frame gets one. And then each frame of, uh, of stores, it's the value of two. All right, next one. Point. You didn't point. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> so that's what I do right there. Seams of bees, frames of capped or uncapped brood, and frames of honey. And remember that I give, I give the frames of honey more importance on that number, okay? Capped honey, if I've got some uncapped, if I've gotten frames of nectar, either from uh, uh, pimbit, dead nettle, you know, I'll count that too, okay? <coughs> so, what do I do with that number? So I got all these colonies out here with these numbers written on them. And usually I use a lumber crayon, okay? What I do, and this is an important part in, in, in the way I keep bees, is because if you're chemical free and you don't treat, you always got to think about increase. You want the stuff that, that survives the winter, and you gotta, you've got to replicate it because there's a reason they survive. They're, they can live with mites, okay? You want to replicate those genetics in your apiary. So, what I do is out of all those numbers, the top third of all the, of the colonies goes into honey production. Obviously, they're the strongest, okay? Um, the middle third, I split all those up into nukes, leaving the queen where she was at, okay? And then the bottom third, this is another key to the way I keep these. The bottom third of all those colonies become resource hives. Now, you might scratch your head and say, what's a resource hive? Resource hives are, are colonies that I have designated to support the rest of the apiary. And what, and in other words, what, what I do is I harvest frames of cat brood from those, give them to production colonies. You put, a, you put one frame of cat brood on both sides, in a production colony, you just put a two-pound package in that colony, okay? If you're making honey, 
You know what? You, that's amazing what you just did with that car. You can use it. You can use that frame to make nukes. Um, I also use these colonies to pull cone. Speaking of cone, we will do a show and tell. I am also a foundationless beginner. I don't use any foundation. Everything in my apiary is, is natural cone. So I'm going to pass this around. And you can and you can see how I wire my frames with Bill. Bill don't be playing the guitar when it gets to you because it, it, it is like a little guitar. But uh, you can see how they how they pull it and, and build that comb right around the wire. Yeah. So you put the wire in if you if it's not there, you put the added wire. Yeah. Or, or there's no wire. Yeah, well, you don't have to have the wire. Okay. Quick, yeah. <laughs> quick story on the wire. Okay. All of you know Bob Blackwood, right? He was my mentor. <coughs> and Cabarrus County has field day uh, every year. Matter of fact, it was this past weekend. And I take bees up there because it's not far from my house. And, uh, the very first time I took bees, of course, Bob does all the inspections on, on, the, on the house part, as part of the demo. He got to mine. And he's sitting there on his, on his little stool. Up, pops the top, grabs the first frame. And you know how you flip a flip a frame to look at it? Bob did that. And the whole thing went woo! It almost <laughs> broke off. Yeah. He looked at me and he said, Mark, I thought I trained you better than that. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, when that happened, I started running those two horizontal, <laughs> those two horizontal frames. I did it just for Bob Blackwell. Um, <laughs> Because even if you don't do that, if, if you wait till they, they build enough of the cone where it's obviously attached across the top and down the two end bars, you're fine. You can pretty much manipulate it however you want to. Um, but that works better. So that's kind of what I use those resource hives for. Frames of brood that I can use however I want to. Um, pulling cone, and I'll actually pull frames of, of honey out of them or nectar. And give and give to splits. So, and this is just this is this is also the time you know when, when I start doing uh, rating rating the colonies and doing and doing my splits. I'll cull comb. Now this goes back to the disease part of like what does a chemical free guy do for disease? Well, you know American foul brood and and European foul brood. One of the best things you can do to Back that is keep a clean hive. Don't you know? Cull your comb in a ten-frame box. As far as brood comb, I will cull twenty percent of that comb every year. In other words, pull two frames out. And all my honey supers, I will pull one frame a year. Now, the reason I do the honey supers like that is because they don't walk on it as much. That they don't have access to that box all year, whereas they do a brood box. Okay. So, I cull comb um, every year, and that and if if you you know you see how how they start building off of that uh, off of the top. Right here's what they're doing. When I cut that comb out, that center mem membrane is still there. They'll use that as their center line and festoon it off of that. Everybody know what festoon is. Does somebody not know what festooning is? Can you spell it? No. I'm from Stanley <laughs> County. <laughs> festooning. Festooning. Hey, ask Siri. How you, how you spell it? No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Okay. Fest oh, the donkey like that, too. Okay. Festooning. If you've ever... If you've ever taken a frame out of a colony and you see the bees, <laughs> you see the bees clinging to each other, hanging down. That is festooning. Okay, what they're actually doing is they're taking their bodies and and making a plumb bob. That's how they build straight combs. Okay, that's why it's important 
for your hive to be level, or as close to level left to right as it can be. Front to back, it don't matter. Left to right, it doesn't matter. Because if it's sitting like this, that plumb bob will go from the top bar on one frame to the bottom bar on the frame beside it, and you've got a mess. So that's how they build straight comb, it's festooned. So that's what they'll do. They'll take that center line, that center membrane, after I cut the old comb out, they'll festoon off of that and pull, pull pretty natural flaps. And unfortunately, this frame is not available anymore. These uh, Kelly Beekeeping um, sold a top bar, the, the top bar frame, that that straight edge was actually built into it because without that, what you have to do is take the cleat out of the top bar, break it off, turn it vertically, nail it back in there. Um, and that made it easy, but, but Kelly doesn't, is, doesn't make them anymore thanks to man like taking them over. But that's the way it is. Um, let's see what's next. Yes. Thank you. I write on, and I don't know if, there might be a picture on here somewhere that shows how I do it, but on the top of my top bars, I'll write the year, like 19. Uh, everything new going to a colony has 19 on it this year. That way I can take the lid off the box, look in there, and automatically know where my old stuff is. And what I try to do, sometime in the summertime, if I know that I'm gonna to wanna to call a cone the next year, move it to the outside. That way it's in position to be taken out. Because obviously I don't want to do that if it's got fruit on it. So, and now's probably a good time to stop and ask if there's any questions. Um, yes. Combs, uh, what is your understanding of dark comb in the high box, in the root box, versus dark comb in the super, and the supers for honey. In other words, do the bees like the dark comb in one or the other, and if so, what for? I can take like that frame. Uh, this is the way I'm gonna answer your question. The question was, is do, uh, do bees prefer light or dark comb, okay? <clears throat> well, let's talk, let's talk about what the queen likes, okay? I can take that frame that I just passed around that natural wax, that's this year's wax, and, and put it in the center of my brood boxes in the morning. And come back that afternoon and the queen's laid it, laid it all up. What's that tell me? The queen prefers that kind of comb, okay? Whether it is because the old comb, the cells are actually smaller as time goes, the bees brood emerges, they clean some of the cocoon out, but there's always some just a little, a little bit left. It builds up and that cell actually will get a little tighter. You know, does she not like that? I don't know. What I do know is that queens will lay in new comb much faster than old comb. Did that answer your question? Yeah, how about honey? I don't know if it really matters for honey. Uh, because the bees really don't see it as a honey frame. They see it as somebody someplace just to store it. And if they hadn't stored uh, honey in that frame yet, then it's open game for the uh, queen to lay in. The reason I ask the question is for the whole group. When I went to uh, McCoy's in uh, Midland, the fella there told me that he thinks we should put a, we should have dark comb in the brood box in the deeps uh, and I'd never heard that before and he said oh yes so you're saying the opposite I always heard that we should take out the dark comb uh, every, every couple years so I, I was just clarifying yeah, I, we've had problems with uh, using dark in the brood they will not lay ours will not lay in the dark they just would not do it. Yeah. And you put new in there and they did fine. Yeah. And, and, and you know, that's what I see. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my motivation um, for, for having fresh comb in there and not letting it, 
you know, don't get oh man, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've got some cone that's three or four years old that I haven't called out yet that is very dark. But I know how old that comb is because I put the date on top of it. I know it's not outside my five year threshold. Five years. Yeah. Every five you in, in a in five years you want a complete rotation of your comb in the room box. That's why I take two frames a year. That's twenty percent in a ten frame box. And then you mathematicians can figure out the eight frame I <laughs> like I said, I'm from Stanley County. I'm, uh, you can maybe a frame and cut one in half or something like that. I'm not real clear on how you count the single beads. Okay, and that's 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 a mark thing. Okay. okay. That's that's just that's kind of how I do it. When I flip that that brew box up and I look, I want to see how I want to see where the bees are on the comb, and I want to see how many they are. You've got the whole box up. I've got it. What? Sorry. Can you go okay. back? Yeah, I'm. I'm Remember where we're coming from. No, she's she's good at this stuff. You're looking at the underside. Yeah, just yeah. the underside. I'm okay. flipping it. Yeah. 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 Yeah
<laughs> the mics are my friend, and the wax moths are my friend. Does Nancy know this? Yes. I promise I'm not a socialist. I know the more I talk, the weirder I get, right? That's okay. But yeah, but now think about what I just said. That's the way it occurs in nature, you know. They don't anybody treat them bees up there in a tree. And that's kind of what I'm trying to replicate, you know. Um, and so far it's worked. So, oh, we're back here. Okay, so. So we've braided the hives. I've done my splits. And with those splits in that middle third, you can do whatever you want to with them. Those nukes, do whatever you want to. You can sell them. Which JR don't want you to, because that's competition. <laughs> but uh, you can sell them. Keep them as increase. Uh, make resource hives out of them. Whatever you want to do. Whoa. We're not supposed to be doing this. Are you talking about summer splits? Buy no, 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 free. Not yet. Not yet. We're good. I'll but uh, but yeah, those, that middle third, those, <laughs> you're right, honey. <laughs> uh, that middle third, that's what you can do with that. And like I said, that top third goes into honey production. Well, this is somewhere right around 1st of April, okay? I super everything. I don't know when everybody puts their honey supers on. Sometimes I'll do it in the middle of March. It don't matter. Uh, but I super everything, all right. And then, and then that's um, that's kind of what I do in April and May is just kind of try to stay ahead of the flow. You know, there's no really chemical free thing that I do in April and May except try to stay ahead of the flow. Will that keep you from having swarms to do them? The question system? is, will that keep me from having swarms this year? No. <laughs> uh, yes, splitting does. Now, in that in that middle third, yeah, I have completely decimated that colony, so there's no reason they should swarm. Okay, that top third that went into honey production and the colonies that are already in my honey yards, your your swarm prevention there. Is throwing supers on them the second and third week in March, you know. Uh, and of course, that bottom third, they're resource hives. I'm pulling stuff out of them all the time anyway, so uh, they're related to they don't swarm. So I don't have a lot of problems with swarms, except I did have one colony that had a rogue queen this year. And I don't know if some of you might, might follow my Facebook page, but I physically watched that colony swarm three times. I watched them in video coming out. You know, you'll have those. Now, back to genetics. Is that something that you want genetically in your apiary? Eh, I don't know. But how do you get it out without squashing the queen? So, so yeah, did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the way I split everything up, you know, that, that stuff's not going to swarm. And the only, the only uh, thing I do as far as honey, the bigger colonies, is just trying to soup from earth. Yeah. Thank you for asking. The question is, how many brood boxes do I overwinter in? You know, the general consensus. <laughs> the general consensus is, in this area, we've always been taught, and I can't look at you anymore because you're back there coaching him, my buddy. Two brood box, two dicks, right? This year, I did an experiment. Because, hey, I'm radical anyway, right? I overwintered over half of my colonies in single deeps. It did great. It did great, okay? Now, there's a different kind of management to that, okay, that I'm still learning, but I've successfully crossed the first hurdle. I got them through winter, okay? Now, are they in one deep box now? No, they're just big. So I got to figure out how I'm going to get them back down to this big. 
And that's what I might need to call you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Uh, I have both. Um, I really like the single deep brew box idea. Easier to check, easier to manage. I think it's easier for the bees to manage. There's not as much real estate in there for them to have to protect, keep clean, keep junk out of, you know, and I think, right, and I think they can better management with, better manage that, which keeps the stress level on the bees lower. And let's talk about stress for a second. Um, and there's lots of great studies going on out there about what, about stresses on bees and what it does to bees. Um, and I think a lot of the things that we do that stresses the bees uh, that we think is beneficial to what they want to do, we're actually hindering them. And the, the, what the least, like my life, if the, the more stress I can keep out of my life, the better. The bees are the same way. So, yeah. Smaller, smaller cavity, less stress. How much honey do you leave on the cup of a Man, the question is, how much honey do I leave on there? Can we get that? We'll get that. Okay. That's on down the line. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Because the next, the yeah. next little thing I'm going to get into is very different. Well, we use just one deep, and then we have a shallow because the mediums are easy uh, too hard for me to handle now and then when the queen goes up and starts laying in that shallow then we invert in March the way Nancy has always taught us to do and then re-invert and then put a queen excluder you don't use queen excluders I bet I do not use queen excluders and if that works for you that's great that goes back to what I talked about in the beginning. Now, all of us kind of do the same thing, just a little bit differently. Why don't you use them? Why don't I use queen excluders? Because it's one more piece of equipment i got to keep up with. Because if you look at a colony, as a colony, as the flow starts, and a, and a colony starts to form that honey cap, okay? Does anybody not know what a honey cap is? Okay. Here's what a honey cap is. Bees always want honey, nectar above them, okay? Once in the brood chamber, if you can kind of do a 3D shot through a, through a colony, like through there, okay? They store the honey above their heads. Well, after a certain point in the center of the brood chamber, they'll start putting honey in the top of those frames. In other words, these frames right here in the middle, that should be the center of the brood chamber. They'll start putting honey in the tops of those. That's the honey cap. Okay? Now, nine times out of ten, a queen will not cross that honey cap. Notice I said nine times out of ten. Because you always got that one rogue hippie queen that will go all the way to the top of your supers and lay five or six frames of brood. It happens. You know, that's the fun part of it. Whenever I see something like that, I just laugh. It's like, I ain't do whatever you want to. Because what will happen as soon as that brood emerges, the forage is back filled up with nectar anyway. And that naturally is how she's forced back down. Okay? All right? Yeah, the honey cap. That's, that's when... No, no, no. It's something the bees do. It's a, yeah, but in 3D, okay? Like all your, all your frames are in here like this. You know, the honey and nectar is always to the outside. But what happens is that honey cap forms over the brood chamber somewhere in here, okay? And once that forms, she won't cross it. Except for that, you know, like I said, that one weird one. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes? How many honey slippers do you set on it? one time when you start with, or does that matter by how? The question is, how many, my initial, when I initially super my, my honey production colonies, how many supers do I put on it? I put two. I put two, and every time I come back, I've got 10 in the truck, just in case. Because if I, get, if, I, if I go ahead and put two on there, you know, I know I've got, I've got a little bit of leeway. 
Okay? Man, I'm all over the chart on that. I'm trying to get more, more standardized. I'm actually going. <clears throat> my objective is sometime before I get really old and, my, and I start walking like this, is <laughs> I'm going to have all eight frame deeps. But, but right now, my standard setup is, is deep brew boxes with, with, with medium circles. Did you mean to say eight frame deeps? Yes. Okay. That's what I'm going to. Okay. That's the and the only way and the only way you can make that change is mentally quit buying the other stuff. <laughs> so eight frame. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to a smaller box instead of ten frame. Box. And yeah. you'll still try a single brood over Wayfair? A single brood box? Mm -hmm. I eight. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard people talk about new going to yeah. Do you mean do your I'll box is smaller? An eight frame box, yeah. I'll Instead of a ten frame box. Well, so the box is smaller. Yes. Yeah. One thing, and, and I just I, the first time I delved into the whole eight frame area was last year, and I will tell you this: the, the colonies I've got in eight frame boxes are much more prolific. They look healthier. They move better in the box. Um, I mean, I've got one that's this tall now. I feel like I'm standing behind a tree, beside a tree stump when I'm standing beside it. But I think, you may not think that those two frames matter. But to the bees, it does. Um, they can, they move better in a, in a more restricted um, cavity. Because that's the whole, that's the whole, the thought process behind going to eight frame equipment you're getting closer to the cavity of a tree. Okay. Any other questions? With the eight frame half, do you find them swarming more? I hadn't had one swarm yet. Yet. I might go home and all of them be empty. <laughs> <laughs> but with those with those colonies, uh, I think the only reason they happen because the one that I said was this big, hey, that's a 60 or 70,000 bee colony. It's huge. It's a monster. But I think the only reason it has not tried to swarm this year, and we'll get to this in the next segment, is because the queen is last year's queen, and when I gave them room this, this spring, I stacked it to the ceiling. I gave them lots of room. And it was amazing how fast they went up through that thing building cost. And she's a young queen. So, okay? So now let's go to the real controversial stuff. Okay, summer splits. This is how I do summer splits. Okay? Every colony that I have except some honey production colonies that are in outdoors. On June the 1st, I don't care what day of the week it falls, I pull the queens out of all of them. Okay? I don't kill them. They're an asset. They all go into nukes. I make these colonies queenless. Okay? On June 1st. Okay? And what am I doing? Okay. If I have to say there's anything that I do that is a mite treatment, it's this, okay? I'm getting a brood break. I do not put cells in them to requeen them. I don't put mated queens in them. I let them do it themselves, okay? It gives a brood break. Okay? I'm trying to figure out what did I mean by increasing more bees? I was wondering the same thing. I don't know on that. Making, making bees what, in the nukes? Well, I will tell you this. Maybe this is what I was thinking. Because, hey, look, doing this presentation was a learning curve, even for, I did this PowerPoint. So I had to learn how to do all that kind of stuff. 
Maybe what I was talking about was, you know, what do I do with those queens? You know, I don't kill them. You know, they are an asset. They still have something left in them they can do for me, okay? They can either go get ready for honey production next year. I can, they can be resource hives, just whatever, okay? So technically, that's what I was talking about. That they're increased. There you go. That's what I was talking about. Thank you, Ed. So, that, so when I pull those queens, I'm making nukes, and those, and that's increased. So if you, if I've got a yard with 20 colonies in it, that yard just suddenly went to 40. Okay. Now, like I said, <coughs> I'll let them requeen. What I do do? I go back after I made them queenless, five days. It's what me and another buddy of mine kind of call the walk back split. You got to go back on day five, okay? Go through those colonies. Any queen cells that you see that are already capped on day five, destroy them. But before you do that, you better make sure you've got one or two that are not capped, okay? Because if you destroy all, if you don't have any that are still open, all you got is capped queen cells, you just better let them do what they're going to do. And this is why. If a colony caps a queen cell within five days of the time they decide they're queens, they picked a larva that was too old, okay? I want that day one, no more than two day larva for them to pick, okay? The cells at that time that are not capped, that's what they picked. They picked a one or two day old larva to make that queen out of. And I want the youngest queen or the youngest larva to be my queen because that queen is fed royal jelly for the longest period of time. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into why that's important. Good Lord, we'd be here forever. That's a whole totally different ball of wax. But the queen, you, you get better queens the longer they eat royal jelly. Okay? And that's why I do that. On day five, I go back and do that. All right? Now, there's another... Increase honey. It's like, golly, what are you talking about? You just made your colony queenless. What are you going to do? Well, think about it. There's no queen in there. Not laying brood. At some point, there's no uncapped brood to feed. I'm doing this on June the 1st. Here in this area, we got a little bit of flow left to the end of June. About usually right around the 20th of June. All that nectar that comes back, since they don't have any brood to feed, it goes for the honey, okay? It's stored, there's nothing to feed, so they can store it. So it increases your honey just a little bit. Now, any questions on that? It should be lots. That was really wild. So do you remove the queen even from the nukes? No, no, it's been queen in the nukes. No, I'm yeah, not. well, if I've got, if I have, if I have nukes, Usually no, you know. So you let it go in. Yeah. Because usually if I have something in a nuke at this time of year, that's a resource colony. Okay, it's not really a production colony. I'm not gonna be breeding from it. So like our nukes, we didn't, we're not gonna touch those two nukes here. Uh, right. Uh, no, actually, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> no, actually, I'm gonna recommend that you pull those queens and get a brood break, and then go into winter with those nukes because that's your backup for next year in case you, got, in case you have losses you need to replace, okay? Mark, what do you do with the queens when you pull them? You know, most of the time I put them in a nuke. Um, and usually what I do is I pull, I pull her in the frame that she's on put them in a nuke box. I'll put another frame of capped brood in there with them. Frame of honey, two of the blanks. What I, what a, to, to me a blank is like that frame I just passed around with no comb on. Most people would call it a foundation frame. And most of the time, I leave them in those nukes uh, to overwinter. A lot of them 
are in this little contraption that I think is on maybe the next. Don't 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 do it. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I got a picture of this new little deal I'm trying. Mark, do you carry all of these with those flags? These that are on it, yeah. Okay. And usually, I'll shake. I'll go to a frame of uncapped brew. 90% of the bees that are going to be on the frame of uncapped brew are going to be nurse bees. I'll give them one shake of, uh, of loose bees in it, too. But, uh, yeah, I'll add a little, bit, a little bit of bees to it. But you got to remember, I put a whole frame of capped brood in there. So that, that brood is going to start emerging really quick. So the population, like I said, you know, a frame of capped brood on both sides, that's a two-pound package once they all emerge. So the population is going to, going to really accelerate in that new quickly. Yes? How well does that comb, uh, that frame that doesn't have, <coughs> that has the natural foundation, how well does it do it in, during the extraction process? Okay, the question is, can I extract those frames? Yes. Does okay? Does fine. Once, if you, if you look at that frame, how toward the top, it's a little darker. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Now this frame has not had any brood in it yet. Okay. The bees secrete a substance. I know. I should probably know what that name of it is. It's like concrete that hardens the wax. Okay. And that's how I can get away with extracting. Foundation of frames. Now, right now, yeah, I'm even putting the two horizontal uh, wires in my medium frames that I extract. So, yeah, you can you can do it. The key to that is, and this is, and you should do this anyway. If you use foundation, when you start extracting, start slow. You know, start real slow. Don't go wide open. You know, this is fun. You don't have to hurry. Um, that lets some of that weight migrate out of the frames. And then as, as you get down, as you look down in there and you start seeing a little bit of honey in the bottom of the extractor, you can see see it hitting the sides, then you can crank it up just a little bit. But that's the key. I think that's one thing that, that beekeepers do wrong is they try to have that extractor running to too fast RPM. And that blow, blows out all the time. And I've never had one blow out. So I've had frames come apart. Man. <laughs> I learned real quick one night while they have those covers that goes over the extractors, it's not so much to keep the honey from coming out, it's shrapnel. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my summer split. I do it on June 1st. Okay. Now, what's the significance of June the 1st? I point, honey. <laughs> Okay, we'll make sure you're that's not that frame, but we'll get there. But okay. here's... <laughs> Which one is it? The next just wait, just wait. I'll talk, I'll talk for a little bit right here. So this, this is just kind of showing kind of what I, where I'm at this time of year. Through May, you know, I've got... And this is my, this is my youngest daughter, Allison. These are some of my, my colonies that are here at the house. That is two double brew boxes, double deeps. All these are honey supers. I ran out of, I ran out of honey supers. All I have is deep stuff sitting around. So I threw that... Uh, that deep on top, seeing if they put honey in it. That is the eight frame, one of the eight frame uh, colonies that I, I told you look like trees, and they're standing. She's standing right beside them. I still haven't figured out how I talked her into doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but if there are bees in those boxes, because you can you can't see it too good on here, but you can look on the screen. There's bees coming and going out of that off that landing board. So. And, and, and that's just how, that's some nukes that I made. I love making nukes. This is, this is the new thing I'm, I'm messing with. It's called a four over four resource hive, okay? In this box, this is a deep box, deep brew box. It has a divider in the middle. There's four cones on either side. There's two colonies in that box, okay? The two colonies can't get to each other. There's an entrance on this side and an entrance on the other side. 
The question was earlier, what do I do with these, these queens when I pull them? Now, moving forward, as I build these things, that's where they're going to go. They're going to go in these four over four configurations to overwinter, thus being my resource hives next year. These are brood boxes that go over them. It, you, you can just keep stacking them up, and the bees can't get to each other. Okay? Now, I had somebody ask me the other day, I had this little thing at the house a couple weeks ago, invited some people over and we taught bees. What's the, what's the benefit of that? Well, the bees have a common wall in the middle. Okay? The two colonies can share heat. Okay? That's, that's the significance of the overwintering part of it, okay? Um, I know some of you might know, might have heard of Kirk Webster, Michael Palmer, up in Vermont. You know, that's like cold. That's how they overwinter a lot of their bees, is in these configurations right here, okay? That's how they do it. Okay, the next one. something on there about the summer solstice? A little happy looking face. That <laughs> looks like something off a of Grateful Dead tour shirt. Unless you with the fishing rod. I mean, don't go to it because I don't want to talk about the robber screens. Okay, all right. Let's talk robber screens real quick. Now, when I pull those queens out on June 1st, make them queenless, obviously they're going to requeen. Um, Last year, I made a really bad mistake. Uh, I went to a new kind of robber screen because remember, end of, end of the month, end of June, the dirt, dirt starts, robbing starts. You gotta do something, right? I went to a new kind of uh, robbing screen that uh, I think it's the June or July edition of Bee Culture Magazine in 2017. It has the dimensions of this. It, all it is is number eight hardware cloth and, and, and it's really easy to make. But anyway, the significance of this is right after I pulled all the queens, okay, it's like, okay, let's be productive. I'm going to put my robber screens on. We're good to go. You know, bad plan. My colonies requeened, right? The virgin queens came out, went on their mating flights, and I guess they were idiots. <laughs> They couldn't remember how to get back in the box. <laughs> I had half of the colonies in one yard where the queen actually went up underneath the colony. And guess who else went out there? <laughs> the whole colony. <laughs> the queen got stuck outside after she went on her mating flight. So the whole colony come out and they started building coal. <laughs> underneath, underneath the bottom board. So, so if you do this, or any time that you are requeening a colony, until you can verify you got a lame queen, don't put robber screens on it, because that's just going to confuse them too much. So anyway, let's see what's next. Summer solstice. <laughs> I've got wiggles. <laughs> <laughs> no okay. I had this cute little picture. <laughs> now, quick story. I did all this on my Mac at home. And the, the, the program on Mac and the program on, on a PC is different. And I had to do an export and all this psychological babble crap. And I guess it lost my pretty face summer solstice thing. <laughs> Man, okay, I actually stole that off the internet. Anyway, the significance. June 1st, I'll pull all the queens. When is the summer solstice? 21st of June. Okay, that's the longest day of the year. From that point on, our days get shorter. Just by a little bit. All right, what's the bees used to, as far as, Half of the things, that, the decisions that they make are based off of what? The, the sun. Okay? The significance of a queen. I have no scientific proof. I don't think anybody's really done the study. 
But a queen that is mated after the summer solstice, okay, goes into winter bee production quicker, okay? And that's what we want, all right? When you start, when a colony starts to get closer to winter, you want as many winter bees as you can in that. Now, the significance of that is winter bees, their fat bodies, they have more fat bodies than summer bees. That's just like going to the beach. You know, some of us go to the beach and we're skinny. Okay? Well, if you go to the beach during the wintertime, everybody's gone. They're fat bodies, right? That's the difference between summer bees and winter bees. It's the fat bodies in their bodies. That's what they live off of. So that's why I do it on June 1st. So queens that are go on their mating flight after the summer solstice. Is that what you said? Queen that is mated after, mated after the, the summer solstice. She will start producing, or, or the brood that she starts raising, at that point will go into, will start being winter bees. But somehow, some way, they make a transition, you know, meta metabolically, into a winter bee. Okay? It happens quicker. Anybody have any questions? So, usually about around the week of the 4th of July, I harvest my honey, okay? So that's, this is my cute little label. And this year, for the first time, I put chemical-free beekeeping since 2014 on my label. Boy, did that start some conversation. <laughs> you know, with people who don't keep bees, it's like, what do you mean people put chemicals on their bees? Yeah, well, some do. So I, I sold out of honey really fast this year, just, just because of that. So yeah, um, right around the 4th of July, I harvest all my honey. I'm doing another little experiment this year. Some of my colonies I've got set aside. I'm actually not going to harvest the honey off of them until late winter, early spring next year. The thought process behind that is that honey, if you take that honey away from them at that time of year, it's true excess, okay? Those colonies won't have to be fed in the fall. It's just something I'm going to try. I'll report back later. How many colonies are you doing? That's top secret. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> <Nice> six. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I'm, you know, and that's, and, that, and that's something I love to do. I've, I've been beekeeping just long enough that I'm dangerous and I'll try stuff. And that's, that's what keeps it fun. So, and, and actually, if any of you were at the... Uh, the state meeting in Monroe. There's a guy from the mountains of Tennessee who actually was talking about that. He harvests all his honey late winter, early spring. He doesn't take honey during the summer. That way, that honey is true excess. You don't have to do any feeding. Okay? So we're going to try it. We're going to see what, what happens. All right, let's see what's next. Do you have an oven to work in to get the honey up? No. I have a remember it's an experiment. I haven't done well, it yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, if you think about it, you know, usually by first of March ish, it's you'll have some sixty degree days. You know, so we'll see. And I, and and hey, look, if all of it is so hard that I can't get it out of the colonies or out of the frames, hey, I got a lot of honey I can feed my bees. Right. That's right. So, so now it's summertime. I've, I've extracted all my honey. It's time to play. You know, everything I do during the summer in the bee yard is just verifying that I'm queen right. There's nothing I really do. So that's when it's time to, you know, read bee books, watch beekeeping YouTube videos, just whatever. You know, go go visit friends. I've gotten to be really good friends with Kim and, and Kathy Flottam. Um, and go fishing. Of course, I love to fish. And the best picture I had of me and one of my daughters fishing was from January. January. So that's why we got jackets on. We were Johnny Mercer Pier down at Wrightsville Beach at a, at a dogfish tournament. And uh, but yeah, you know, go have fun during the summertime. I don't, you know, being chemical free. I don't have. To, I'm not worried about the mites and treating and all that kind of stuff over the summertime. Whether or not it's too hot. To, to put the formic acid on there. I mean, I just don't have to think about stuff like that. Plus, I don't have to buy it. Um, and 
this also? Okay. Okay. Now we're down to fall. Great time of year. I, I love this time of year. Uh, of course, the fall flow usually starts and it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it's, it fluctuates. You know, sometime in September into October, we'll have goldenrod, we'll have aster and stuff like that. Uh, so, and, and if any, any of you have been beekeeping around here long, long, you know, long at all, <coughs> the fall flow is like gambling. Sometimes we have one. We don't. Uh, so I've never, I've never seen a fall flow uh, since I've been keeping bees strong enough that you could actually harvest fall honey. Uh, I know some people have, but, uh, but I haven't. So, so you know, the fall flow starts. You got goldenrod, aster. Let's see what's next. Okay, we don't want to get to that yet. <laughs> All right, after I've seen after I've seen what the fall flow did. Whoa, you're way out there. <laughs> <laughs> you still got barbecue sauce on your fingers, honey? Yes, it's done. <laughs> okay. So after I've kind of seen what the fall flow is going to do, um, and this is something a little different that I do that, that in the chemical free, treatment free world in some groups is taboo. This go, who, who asked me about feeding earlier? Did you ask me about feeding? Do I feed? Sugar. 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 Okay. The dry sugar. Okay, we'll get to that. This time of year, that's when I start weighing hives. Seeing how much stuff I got in there. I start planning for winter, okay? In September and October. What I do is I try to put five gallons of uh, sugar syrup on every column. Okay? Where do I get my sugar syrup? Domino sugar on my road road trough. I don't cut it, I give it to them straight. And I try to get five gallons on each one. It's like, oh my God. Five <coughs> gallons? Yeah, you gotta think about it. They're gonna reduce that five gallons down to about two and a half gallons of stuff they can use once they get, get all the water out of it. So five gallons may sound like a lot, but at the end of the day, it's really not. Okay. Is it one to one? No. no. Just straight sugar. I never. Are you talking about dry sugar? No, I haven't got that far yet. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know. Have I got you? Is it two to one or one to one? I don't cut it. The sugar syrup, I feed it to them straight. He buys it as sugar syrup. Yeah, Domino sugar in Charlotte. You can get liquefied sugar. I'm just telling you what I do. Okay. Oh, it has some water. It wouldn't be fluid. But I don't. Like it's a syrup. Sure. They sell it. Yeah. They use it. They they, they are a they are a supplier to Pepsi, Coca Cola, okay, Frito Lay, Lance. Right. That's where they get their sweeteners from. They tell you that it's two to one. It's that yeah. One. yeah. Yeah. Two to one. So it's right. But I don't cut it. I feed it to them straight. The one to one stuff. I, I don't. And the, this that's the only time of year that I feed syrup. Okay. Is then and I feed it to them straight. Um, all right, now, the next one. This is the last thing I do. And this is what you've asked about. If you think about it in December, right around the middle of December, before Christmas, I don't know, I don't know how it always works out this way, but the second or third week in December, we'll be just a little bit warm. We'll be warm enough that we can go into a colony, okay? On every colony, that I have, that's nukes, production colonies, resource colonies, I don't care what it is. I do what's called a mountain camp feeding, okay? I lay, and of course this picture cloth is really not that good, sorry about that, but what I do is I open the colony and I'll lay newspaper on top of the frames, all right? I'll take an empty box and put that on top of that. And I literally pour dry sugar in there. Okay, that is my insurance to get them through the winter. Okay, um, I have historically had to take a lot of that off, you know, in the spring, throw it away, use it in my coffee, and make sure it don't get Polly's coffee. <laughs> because if Polly knew that was in her coffee, she would probably kill me. <laughs> but it's insurance. 
And you might think, well, how in the world did bees eat that? Well, what it is, as they're, as they're <coughs> respirating, breathing, whatever, it creates moisture in the colony. That moisture comes up through the colony, okay, and it hits that sugar and solidifies it a little bit and makes it where the bees can eat it, okay? Is it the best thing for them? No. But they don't starve. If they go through all of their resources as they come up through the, through the brood chamber over the course of the winter, I'm not going to let my bees starve. I'll let a bee die because of mites, but not starve, okay? And, and let me tell you why. We have degraded our environment to the point that bees, the forage is just not out there, okay? And that's why in my management scheme, feeding is okay. Because it is because of what I did as a human that they don't have enough food out there. Okay? That's why I think it's okay to feed them. That's why I think we should. Some of the pu purists in the, in the treatment free world says no. That's unnatural. That's a treatment. Okay. That's fine. That's what you want to do. But that's the way I look at it. We've taken away so much of their forage and, and, and depleted it to the point that there's not enough stuff out there for them. And I feel, as a human, that I need to supplement that. So that's why I do that. That's the last thing um, in the year that I do. And of course, like I said earlier, you know, like in February, once, once a colony gets to red maple, okay, nine times out of 10, I'll take that off, okay? But that's my insurance. Mark, how much sugar are you putting in when you put them in the first second? Oh boy, that's the story. <laughs> First time I ever did that. I think I bought, I wonder if I bought a little four pound, oh, I found some place had these little four pound bags of sugar. I put four pounds of sugar on every column. Oh my gosh, man. I mean, you know, I feel way a lot of sugar in here. And, uh, but now I've got a little uh, Folgers coffee jug that coffee comes in. And I'll take, I'll go to Walmart or wherever it's cheapest and get me some of those big 25 pound bags of sugar, pour them in a five gallon bucket, and I'll go right around with that little coffee cup that the Folgers coffee came in. Put that on, that's it. And that's used beer. I mean, I've had some that went, that, that when I opened them in February, about the only thing that was left was just some little pieces, but they had food. They didn't starve. I got them to Hembit, Dead Metal, and Red Maple. And that was their jacket. What's the next the new, one? The newspaper you're covering all the frames or just the non the sugar? Um, open all the frames. Well, yeah. what I usually do, and yeah, this is something you've got to play with. What I usually do, I always stand behind the colony. I put the newspaper on there, and from the front of the colony, I might leave a gap like that. I don't know that's really necessary because if they get to the top underneath that newspaper, they'll chew their way through it. So I didn't know if you were leaving gaps to encourage them to come up around and get it and not chew through. No. You know, some people you know will cut uh, slots in the newspaper. I don't do that. They'll chew through it. Now, yeah. What's the next screen, huh? Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. On the the. The red maple and the hen bit with that nettle, are they only getting pollen or do they get any nectar on that? Excuse me. <laughs> 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 the donkey answered your question. I didn't hear your question. You know, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. Repeat the question. Okay, the question was uh, in the spring, late winter, early spring, of course, around here, sometimes all winter long. You have dead nettle, hembit that that bloom. Um, I really don't know if it's pollen or nectar or both. Does anybody know? What do they What do they mainly get from those? They can get both oh. out of them. Uh, That's what I thought. Yeah, and I think red maple does both. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, as a rule of thumb, once you get to red maple bloom, you're good. In my book. Ah. Uh, Questions? All right. You said that you put the news.
Inspector down in Bibi's, did you not say that you put a box down? Yeah, just an empty box. Empty but, but how, how, I mean, super. how much of that is it covering? It's a super. It's a super. It's a super. Wow. A super. Oh. Yeah. Like you, like, yeah. Like if you got ten, if you if you got a colony in ten frame equipment, just put your empty ten frame box on. Could you use like a feeding ring? The you can do that. Yeah. I got you. Yeah, a lot of people do shims. I did that one time, and I and I just found it was easier to use the equipment that I've already had or got than to do shims. Any other questions? Really? I thought we'd stand here till 10 o'clock answering stuff. <laughs> 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 We've answered questions throughout, so that's wonderful. What time is it? 8.15. 8.15? Is See, I was worried. There's a couple people here that, were at, that came to the house. <laughs> I had this open house at my home apiary, and the whole gist of it was, in my mind, my presentation walking in people through my bees was this, okay? I was making mental notes what I was going to talk about. So they were actually my guinea pigs and didn't know it. It took three and a half hours for me to do my presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, as some of you know, uh, I, I am with Cabarrus County Beekeepers. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, you're making me dizzy, honey. You've got to figure out what you're going to do. All right, here's, all right real quick, here's, here's, here's a quick commercial. Um, Flatwoods Bee Farm, that's what I'm called. i got a Facebook page. i got a YouTube page. Um, YouTube page is, you know, I'm not the fat bee man. I don't, I, I don't try to do instructional videos. I want to show you what I do. Um, and I think I think sometimes people can learn a lot more just from seeing what somebody does. Um, but that's the, that's the name of the name of my farm on Facebook and YouTube. Okay, honey, what's next? Would you stand in front of it so I can get your face in a mic? I didn't stand in front of the screen. My face? Yeah. Oh my lord! Yeah. You want the other flat? Wait, let me you do the commercial the first. On it? Oh, okay. What did that last? Okay. <laughs> As most of you know, I'm with Cabarrus County Beekeepers. We started an event last year in uh, late summer, early fall. We had Kim Flottam last year, uh, the editor of Bee Culture Magazine at Cabarrus Arena. This year, on September 28th, we've got Dr. David Tarpey from uh, NC State, and we've got Jennifer Berry from the University of Georgia at Cabarrus Arena on uh, September 28th. Tickets are on sale now at CabarrusBees.com. Or you can go to Cabarrus um, Beekeepers Facebook page on the events. There's an event there. You can click that event and order the tickets through Facebook, okay? And we would love to have it. Tickets are just $20. It includes the meal. If there's anybody here that came last year, yes. the food it was, alone. It was excellent. The Absolutely. food alone is worth 20 bucks. So, and you get to listen to two great people talk. Now, let me give you a little heads up. Yes, I'm the coordinator for all that. I'm the program coordinator for the club, but I schedule these people and, and negotiate with them. Next year, in 2020, we've got Kirk Webster and Wyatt Mangle wow. coming. In 2021, we have Dr. Jamie Ellis out of the University of Florida and uh, Dr. Kirsten Trainer who used to be the editor of American Beach Journal. So we're really excited. It's something we love to do. It's something we do as a club. It give, gives us something a little dip, something more that we can do together. And we enjoy doing it. We'd love to have it. And all of you, and I think that's the last one. Is that the last frame, honey? Mm -hmm. Except for that. And Jennifer Berry is definitely the one that's Oh, let me tell you something. Great. Let me tell you something. I started talking to these two. I started talking to these two last year. And uh, I had always heard that Jennifer has a great sense of humor. Well, I did a little conference call on my deck with a cup of coffee with both of them, you know, talking. And it was like I didn't exist. <laughs> they got to going back and forth, joking at each other. 
uh, you know, busting each other's chops. And it was like sitting in a comedy club. So this year's event should not only be educational, but it'll be entertaining as well. Okay? If there's no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for, le for letting me talk about the way I keep these. Thank you.